delicious icicles of sound just trickling from all corners of the room. Prior preparation prevents piss poor performances. First of all, people consider me both very charming and also very formidable, which is, I think, characteristic features of the Dragon Lady. They're, they're bossy. They are, they are formidable. They assert their presence. They know what they want. They're very clear in their minds about who they are. And I think I fit all those attributes of the Dragon Lady. She's a force. And, um, and I kind of, that, that kind of, that energy that she has and a witch is what's kind of guided her and driven her through life is, is amazing. Um, so, that's what interested me about her. She's obviously she's an incredible musician, and um, and uh, I kind of a real iconoclast. Like I love the way that she's outspoken and she's got that incredibly direct, candid, take no prisoners kind of approach to life and art, and uh, and I like that. Courtesy of Ecclesiastes. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. It's two general narrative. Of course, story as well as music. But you know, music is so powerful. It's so evocative. Uh, it's so imaginative. What should not be said could be performed in music, and what music can do. Uh, that, you know, I don't need that. So it's, it's really constantly trying to struggle with what stories need not be told so that the music can tell everything. It breaks down barriers for sure. Um, sort of approachable in a way that a typical classical presentation might not be approachable for some people. It's funny. It can be funny. I, I've... I thought this is a really perfect vehicle to become a sit-down comic. I want to be a sit-down comic. You know, there are enough stand-up comics. How many sit-down comics are there? So there's that incongruity of, um, you know, presenting yourself in a in a formal classical setting, but on a sort of ridiculously small instrument. So that certainly is something that. Um, she's been playing on. I want to be an entertainer. That to me is the prime reason to go on stage. It's just to entertain people. I'm not out to convert or, or preach to anybody, but, I, but if they happen to like avant-garde music, 
through the toy piano, which is a very insidious way, isn't it, of introducing people to avant-garde music. And after a concert, people come up to me and say, oh, we love avant-garde music. <laughs> well, mission accomplished. <laughs> Even the term scares people away. <laughs> Even the word modern music, you know, makes people want to run, run a mile. So I, I avoid all those words. It's, it's, it's just toy music. Now, who can resist toy music? And Margaret, you know, as is this incredible force, as I said, incredibly candid, and that makes her, at times, you know, challenging to work with. Because <laughs> she doesn't um, gild the lily. And she's, uh, so I, you know, there were some fairly robust conversations that were had at times. People think I'm, I'm, I'm arrogant. No, not so much arrogant, that I've got attitude. But what's a dragon lady without attitude, right? <laughs> but there was one day when I brought in, we listened to like 15 of my sketches and it was just like, she just, oh, she just ripped them apart one by one. <laughs> Someone made a piece of work and then when we listen, we say, hmm, maybe this. And I have to say, he's really, you know, and he goes, ah, let me explain why this is so. But let me also look at it. And so she, she allows us actually to play around with it. And, 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 and uh, sometimes, you know, Margaret would be very harsh to say, I don't like it. But then we create a the space then for Eric to try it and Margaret to try it. And in the end, we realise that, hey, the piece work. Something happens. And then there is discovery. And so we are constantly in that, that space. She was incredible because she was making herself incredibly open, incredibly vulnerable, really, and astonishingly flexible, actually. You know, for someone who is a self-confessed control freak. They did end up flat. Yeah, but you don't want those to face the audience. The, 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 you don't want those, that bottom side uh, to face the audience. So I think it was, so how, I, how think you came, I think then you came in like this, mm. and then, Put it like uh, yeah, it was sideways. Yeah. Right, that's right. It was sideways. Right, so then I can put the melodica there later. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I forgot that. And I got to really get a yeah, handle well, let's, on that Let's one. have another look at that one in a sec. I just want to say the... Um, this is beautiful. This text up here. I'd be like the bell ringer. Just the t that tone you're getting there. John said you got it. It's light. It's gentle. Personal, it's just right, it's just in the right place. Okay, good. So I'm glad you like it. So, if you remember that quality, I think that's what we want to find in this last section. I think it's quite known that she talks about uh, her OCD. Yeah. Uh, and so, when we were talking to her and when we had long conversations, we really had long conversations, just sit down and where she has a toy piano and she starts playing and we say, hey, but why? Why are you doing this? But what were you thinking when you were hitting the notes? And that's where she started talking about very deeply about how she counts, what are the things that goes inside her head. And then I asked her, can you just demonstrate how you count inside your head for me? And she looks at me and she says, not now, when I'm ready, I'll tell you. So finally, just as we were wrapping up the meeting, she stood up and said, I'm going to show you how I count. And I think that it's like one of the most, most, private moment you ever get to see an artist dealing with herself, her everyday, and yet dealing with art. She was amazingly generous 
and she really came for the ride and she really invested in that ride. I think that was one of the biggest challenges. Um, asking to her invest because she needed to trust us and then once she did, feeling like we had to live up to that uh, investment. Uh, yeah, because she was incredible in, in the way that she gave over to the process and someone who has never collaborated to go, okay, I'm placing my trust in this team. And there's real, um, you know, depth to the sense of a story of someone who's, well, she was 74 when we made the work. You know, a, a long, that's a long story and a lot of experience and a lot of relationships and um, influences and shifts through. I mean, if you think about what's happened to contemporary experimental practice in that period, it's amazing amazing period and she was there yeah that was obviously one of the other things that was exciting about Margaret is that she was kind of right there and had is this direct link to these major forces in in um in experimental 20th century experimental practice I'm going to finish preparing the piano I'm going to insert four bolts between the strings a prepared piano is one that's been altered by placing objects, bolts, screws, bits of paper and rubber in between the strings. And what it does is it transforms the piano into a miniature percussion orchestra. So again, this was an idea that was pioneered by John Cage, who really set a lot of the, set the example for what's been done since then. Score. I'll, I'll get the score in a second. Okay, so you have this middle layer. Which is just four notes. Yeah. For each note on the keyboard, there are three strings. Um, so I've placed a preparation between two of those three strings. And I've left one of the strings in the original. Mm -hmm. uh, open so the sound still, so you get a combo of, so, of a prepared and normal tone. Yep, mm -hmm. so, now we, so now we get two notes. Oh, this lower one do you prepare as well? No. You don't? Just I'll, I'll, I'll get to that in a second. Okay, so, alright, so now, so now this is... But um, one of the things that's unique about, I guess, about my approach to prepared piano is that I've um, put uh, I put a lot of emphasis on the tuning of the instrument. So um, when you put bolts, in particular, in between the strings, it changes the pitch uh, of the of that particular note. So um, by sliding the bolts back and forth across the length of the string, I can actually retune the instrument. And so that's been fundamental to my approach, um, is creating these kind of uh, interesting and unusual scales um, or harmonies. Um, and in a way, that's part of the composition in, of, of this show, is that I first designed the tuning, if you want, or designed the harmonies of, of the music. And then um, using that harmony, I created the individual pieces.
are particular scales and modes that I'm always drawn to and they tend to be ones which are ambiguous. You don't know if they're major or minor. You don't know if they're uh, nervous or triumphant. They, they, they sit somewhere in between. They have an ambivalent quality to them. Notes are notes, but you have to get into the meaning behind the notes. And Eric wrote the score with me specifically in mind. It's repetitive, it's minimalistic, it's obsessive, it's driving, and it's also got great moments of intimacy and pathos. He's really depicting the essence of me. He's captured the essence of me in this piece, and that's the highest tribute, isn't it, that I could give him. There's, there's more than one way to say, to express an idea. So, um, you know, we can say things in lots of different ways. So when I'm composing um, a work, let's say there might be three or four possible ways that I could orchestrate it or, you know, for the instrument. And so what I'm doing is I'm thinking about which one of those four ways is going to work for Margaret. So which one of those is going to give her the chance to not only um, express that particular moment of that scene, but also to express herself. I think that what is interesting about Margaret's approach is that she has a very detailed um, approach to phrasing and nuance and articulation. Um, also things like pedaling. So these are things because I'm a more improvisatory type of performer. So for me, I, I'm happy to play things um, a different way in the moment, depending on how I feel. Um, now, I mean, of course, Margaret can can play like that if she wants to, but um, what she often does is she very carefully works out the details and the nuance of the interpretation um, in a way that I would never do. Um, so I think it's that's we've had some fascinating exchanges during the rehearsals where. Um, she was asking me questions about, well, should I phrase it this way? Should I put the emphasis on this note? Should I pedal it this way? And um, I, each one of those options brings out a different quality in the music. Once I'm committed to somebody's music because I believe 100% and more in their talent and ability to understand what I'm after, I give them my all, whether it's George Crumb or Eric Griswold. And in so doing, I make the music my own. In fact, several people have said to me, you know, I don't know where the music where the composer ends and you begin. And I said, that is as it should be. I am the composer's right. voice. When, see, when you compress it into, you know, into a short of... Can the left hand do its own thing and just get more stronger and weaker in place? Or do you want the left hand also uniform? Well, I, that's what I thought. Uniform? And, and I thought of this as very slight. Oh, well, I see it as confronting the terror on the eyeballs. I know, <laughs> but, but I wanted... <laughs> I wanted the contrast between this piece ah, and this piece. Okay, we're all held Rather than a contrast within this piece. I get it. Okay. 
But you know, I like the syncopation here, John. I, I, uh -huh. I make a big thing out of, uh -huh. of that. Uh -huh. But let me just play it from here. But in the end, I also become the music. I am the music. There is no line of demarcation between, you know, where the composer stops and I start. I mean, that's a bit loud than I did earlier. Thinking in terms of those, her connection to the history of experimental music, those composers that whose work she's championed were very much innovators and people who were um, expanding the possibilities of the medium. So John Cage's use of toy piano, his use of found objects and other toys, George Crumb's exploration of playing the strings of the piano and inventing techniques for that. So this idea of invention and innovation, um, that was something I felt like I had to explore. There is a kind of a resolve of sorts. There's because there's the we come to the end of Cage and the end of her mother's life. Those these two major forces, Cage and her mother, that have kind of run throughout the work and throughout Margaret's life. There's a moment just before the end of the work where um, both of their deaths are related um, by Margaret and they intersect in that moment. It's the first time where those two figures kind of intersect in time. And so in that sense there's a resolve, there's a sense of something coming to the end. But that's not the end of the work and Margaret continues on from there and she takes stock of what's happened. She looks back to, she counts up the objects that have shaped the narrative in a way. Um, but then she continues on because it's not the end of her story. So we have a sense of that she's moving on to make to the next chapter, to what yeah, what what what's what's to come, not just what's happened. The thing is, when people are going to spend two hours in a theatre with me, I want them to give me their undivided attention. I want them to be thoroughly engaged and forget all about the world outside that they left behind. Whatever worries, cares they had, do not be making up tomorrow's grocery list whilst you're watching me. You know, you can do that in somebody else's concert, but not mine because I won't allow you to. Not because I forbid you, but because the music I play is so compelling. And the way I communicate, it forces you to listen. And your mind cannot be somewhere else then. 